Okay guys, here is our video on the process of titrations, how they work, and the calculations that, that are associated with it. Uh, we're going to start with a video from a company called Carolina, Carolina Biological Supply Company. They walk through a very, very step-by-step -step detailed explanation of how titrations work. So we'll watch that first, and then when we're, when we're done with that, uh, we will switch over to a video of myself doing a titration with one of the hours uh, in class today and then we will switch to the calculation part that shows the calculations that correlate with the titrations that we are doing. So this is actually a three-part video uh, so I will have it loaded up as one big video and I think I'm going to also load it up as three separate uh, videos so you can break it down into smaller chunks if you want to. Alright guys, uh, here you go. The purpose of a titration is to quantitatively determine the concentration of an unknown solution, commonly called the titrand or analyte, by adding a volume of a chemical with a known concentration called the titrant. To mark the endpoint of a titration, an indicator is added to the analyte. Let's review some of the equipment that's needed for a titration. Carolina's complete burette assembly contains the basic equipment to get you started, including a burette, ring stand, and a burette clamp. A burette is a long, narrow, graduated tube used to add titrant. It has a stopcock to regulate the flow of liquid. Notice that the markings on the burette go from lowest at the top to highest at the bottom. The ring stand and burette clamp are used to mount and secure your burette. Other materials you will also need include a small funnel to help you fill the burette, a 125 milliliter Erlenmeyer flask, which works best for titrations. The shape of the flask allows for more vigorous swirling than a beaker or other glassware and minimizes spill hazards. A volumetric pipette and pipette bulb to transfer a known volume of analyte to the flask. A wash bottle filled with deionized water, a beaker or flask of titrant and of analyte, indicator selected for your reaction, a reading card to help read the meniscus, and a sheet of white paper to help visualize the endpoint. To prepare your burette for the titration, it is good laboratory practice to rinse your burette thoroughly with deionized water, then with a small amount of titrant. After each rinse, open the stopcock to allow the liquid to drain out the bottom. If there is a lot of liquid clinging to the walls of the burette, then thoroughly clean your burette and repeat the rinse process. The accuracy of this technique is dependent on the titrant flowing into the flask and not sticking to the walls of the burette. Mount the burette in the clamp, making sure it is positioned vertically, and there is enough room to position your flask underneath the tip. Check to see that the stopcock is in the closed position. Insert the funnel into the top of the burette and fill with titrant almost to the top. Filling exactly to the zero mark is not necessary but you do need sufficient titrant to complete the reaction. Check the column for air bubbles and gently tap to free them from the side walls. Remove the funnel. Place the Erlenmeyer flask under the tip and open the stopcock to allow a few milliliters of titrant to flow through, releasing any trapped air. Rinse the tip of the burette with water. Empty the liquid into a waste container and thoroughly rinse the flask. It is not necessary to dry the flask. Record your starting volume. It is important to accurately read the volume on the burette. First, note that the liquid forms a concave meniscus because the water pulls itself up the side walls of the glass. You should read the volume from the bottom of the meniscus at eye level. Secondly, it is important to read your volume to the correct number of significant figures. This burette indicates volume to the nearest 0.1 milliliters. With any graduated glassware, record the volume to one additional decimal place beyond the smallest graduation. In this case, record the volume to the nearest hundredth of a milliliter, estimating the final place. In our burettes, we'll have the exact same type of burettes that they have there, so uh, we'll also be recording our volumes to the one hundredth of a milliliter, so make sure you do that when you guys do your elaborate stuff. Use the volumetric pipette to transfer the analyte to the flask. We do not have volumetric pipettes uh, in our lab, so uh, the best thing we can do is use our graduated cylinders. Uh, so we will use a graduated cylinder to measure out the amount of volume that we're putting into our flask. 
Um, again, just make sure you do that as precise as possible because volume, uh, the exact volume readings are, are must in this, in this lab. So. so no volumetric pipette with we'll use graduated cylinders. Add a few drops of indicator to the flask and swirl. Place the flask under the tip of the burette. Record this volume. Placing a piece of white paper under the Erlenmeyer flask may make it easier to detect the color change. Uh, they kind of make this sound like it's an optional thing. In reality, we're going to be using an indicator called phenolphthalein in our labs. And phenolphthalein is clear um, in a certain type of solution and is, is pink in another. So it's clear as an acid and it's pink as a base. Um, with our black lab tables, if you do not put a piece of white paper underneath it, it's really hard to see the turnover and color between pink and, and clear. So that is a requirement for us. So you have to have a piece of white paper down um, when you are doing your titrations in our lab. Operating the burette requires two hands. One hand turns the stopcock, while the other hand swirls the flask. Practice turning the stopcock a few times to familiarize yourself with how quickly the flow starts and stops. It is common laboratory practice that the first titration is an estimate. Open up the stopcock and allow the titrant to enter the flask quickly. Continuously swirl the flask. As the volume of titrant in the flask increases, the color of the indicator appears, then disappears as you swirl. When the analyte becomes a colored solution, close the stopcock. Record the final volume of the burette. Subtract the initial volume from this final volume to get the estimated volume of titrant needed for this titration. Knowing the volume that is a little past the endpoint, subtract 5 milliliters from that number to get the amount of titrant that can be safely added before a slower addition is required. As the estimate titration shows, a dark colored solution indicates an excess of titrant has been added. The desired endpoint is a pale, faintly colored analyte. So you notice how this one, you can barely see the pink developing in this one, where this one they've obviously overshot the endpoint or they've gone too far. So it's nothing, there's nothing wrong with doing this one in your first trial to get kind of an idea of how much it takes to come out of your burette. Um, but in trials after your first one, you should be hitting endpoints that look more like this in terms of your stuff. So this is an estimate to give you an idea of how much, and then you would actually use your precision on your following trials. To reduce the risk of passing the endpoint, slow down the addition of titrant when flashes of color begin to appear in the analyte. Adjust the stopcock to slow the flow of titrant to a dropwise rate. Continue to swirl the flask with one hand and keep the other hand ready to close the stopcock. When you notice the indicator taking longer to fade, close the stopcock. Rinse the tip of the burette with deionized water and swirl the flask. Record the final volume on the burette. The reason why you rinse the tip is you might have a little bit of a drop on the end of the tip of the burette and that has already been accounted for as being gone from your burette. So um, it's, since it's been accounted for, you should get it in here. Now adding deionized water doesn't affect your results because the water has no concentration of acid or base. So it dilutes it a little bit, but it doesn't really change any of our math or any amounts of solute inside these solutions. So using extra water doesn't hurt this step. If the analyte remains faintly colored, then you have reached the endpoint. If the analyte is still colorless, then repeat these steps. Add a drop, rinse, swirl, and record until a faint color persists. Typically, titrations are performed in triplicate. Use the average volume of the titrant required to reach the endpoint for any calculations. You now know how to properly perform a titration.